um, I'm going to turn this over now to Greg Mueller, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Anyway, good evening, everybody. Really a pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Keith Seifer. Um, I've known Keith for longer than both of us want to admit. Um, and um, Keith has been uh, at, uh, was at uh, 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 Canadian uh, Ag, Ag Canada for a number of years. He was really a specialist in, in microfungi, fungi in foodstuffs and farms and whatever else. Um, he's currently a uh, professor emeritus at Carleton College in Ottawa. And he's been spending his time writing some really cool books. Um, one of his books was The Hidden, Hidden, Hidden Kingdom of Fungi, Exploring the Microscopic uh, World of Fungi. And then today, he's going to be talking about some of the stuff from his newest book, Kingdom of Fungi, Exploring the Microscopic World of Forest, Homes, and Bodies. And I should say, one of uh, his claim to fame is that he was president of IMA, not our IMA, but the International Mycological Association, which is a big deal. And so um, it's really a thrill to have Keith here. And um, um, it's um, he might be the one that's bringing the snow tomorrow. I'm not sure. I don't know what it's doing in Ottawa, but it might be snowing there already. I'm not sure. But uh, it's going to be here tomorrow. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you, Keith. Looking forward to your presentation. So uh, I'd like to thank Catherine and everybody for the invitation to speak with the Illinois Mycological Association and Greg for the kind introduction. He stole some of my jokes, but I uh, the excuse for this talk is the publication of this book, The Hidden Kingdom of Fungi, which was released last May and is now widely available. And the book's a bit different than most of the mycology books that are out there meant for general readers because it's mostly about microscopic fungi and it focuses on their interaction with various aspects of human life and your president Matt Nelson in fact helped me out with some parts of the book the parts dealing with lichens of course and so he's the president of the IMA now and I used to be the president of a different IMA and I had jokes about the Icelandic Mycological Association, but we'll, ju we'll just move on. Um, so I'd like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Walt Sundberg. And I'm sure most of you, many of you knew Walt. I first met Walt at um, a meeting of the Mycological Society of America in Bloomington, Illinois, where they filmed the famous movie Breaking Away in about 1981. And for some reason that I never understood, he remembered me. And when I defended my PhD in 1985, Walt sent me a very kind letter of congratulations, welcoming me to the mycological community. And I was very touched and it didn't occur to me until much, much later that he probably wrote letters to every student whose defense was mentioned in the MSA newsletter. But still, it was very nice. And Walt worked with mainly with mushrooms, and there won't be much about mushrooms today, but I'm willing to bet that he lived in a house. My talk today is a, a slightly more scientific version of chapter six in the Hidden Kingdom, uh, which is also called the Secret House. And I realize that most of you are interested in mushrooms. But one thing about an interest in indoor mycology is that it gives you something to do when it's snowing outside. And I suspect that many of you in, in Illinois experience a very similar winter to what we have here in Ontario, frigid temperatures and dry air. So our heating systems get a really good workout. And uh, Greg mentioned, I wondered whether we're getting snow. We're expecting our first snow tomorrow. So it gives a particular poignancy to Canadians and probably to Illinoisians of that catchphrase from the Game of Thrones, winter is coming. So most people don't consider buildings to be ecological environments. So we construct our houses to keep the climate and other organisms out, but it's hopeless really. There's thousands of fungi and other organisms that find their way inside. But buildings aren't homogenous ecosystems. In any building, there are sub-environments, 
there's different areas that offer different opportunities to different fungi. So I'd like to approach this tour of indoor mycology from an ecological perspective. So the fungal biodiversity of a building starts with its location. The house I'm sitting in now is surrounded by a forest. So there's lots of spores that will blow in on the wind, including Lactaria spores. But are these indoor fungi? Not really. We think of indoor fungi, indoor biodiversity to be the fungi that actually grow inside. So in a lab survey using cultural techniques or DNA detection, the indoor biodiversity is the long list of fungi detected minus the list of the fungi that are growing outside. And you don't really have to look very hard in most houses to see some fungi. So a typical house will contain about 20 or 30 visible, visible fungal species. And most of them are associated in some way with food. And I'll focus mostly on these common fungi. But a more intense mycological survey might find 100 or 200 species of fungi that we can see with when we culture on agar. And DNA surveys, as you might imagine, tell a different story and I'll talk about them towards the end. So I'd like to get this part of the story out of the way quickly, especially in North America, there's a lot of worry about molds in houses. And if you depend on the internet, You'll have nightmares if you look for information about indoor molds. Your, your nightmare might look like this. This house looks so bad, I wonder if it's staged or some kind of bizarre art installation. You'd have to be crazy to walk into a house like this without a protective suit. And you'd want to disinfect the camera when you were finished. Most of the concern is about this fungus, Stachybotrys chartarum which has been associated with some really serious health incidents. And the most famous one was in Cleveland, Ohio, so south of you, in 1993 and 1994, where about a dozen babies died in a poorly maintained older wooden homes. Stachybotrys really likes water-saturated cellulose. And in nature, it grows on dead plant material like straw. But in houses, it forms black splotches like that in the background on wallpaper, ceiling tiles, insulation, or drywall. You know, drywall absorbs water and swells up like a sponge. So when it gets wet, and then, and then it's covered with a layer of paper, so that easily goes moldy. And when Stacky is alive, though, its spores are very sticky. So it doesn't really get into air samples very often, although dried fragments of dead spores um, and mycelium can get airborne. So in a wall cavity or under a floor, Stachybotrys can spread over several square yards without anybody noticing. Its spores have a high concentration of a potent chemical called satratoxin, which is the structure shown there. And if inhaled, satratoxin inhibits the amoeba-like white blood cells of our immune systems, which are called macrophages, leading to serious inflammation and bleeding. The species is quite common. And where I used to work, we found it on the wallpaper and uh, it, it, where there were leaks in the lab and on wet peat flower pots actually that they used in the greenhouse. But black mold colonies don't always mean stachybotrys. In houses and on plants, you often see sparse black colonies of Alternaria alternata and with a microscope, you can see the chains of brown club-shaped multi-celled spores. And you often also see branched bead-like chains of Cladosporium cladosporioides. And both of these fungi make blackish colonies that are often blamed for allergies, but they're so common inside and outside that their significance in the indoor environment is quite difficult to evaluate. Outside, the abundance of their spores rises and falls in concert with the, the amount of decaying vegetation in the spring and in the autumn, but inside they grow year round. They just need a little bit of moisture from a little leak or a condensation to get going. In one house I lived in, there was always condensation on the ceramic floor in the downstairs bathroom. And, 
and cladosporium grew in a faint haze across the tiles. And the upstairs shower drain had a leak in it um, that leaked through to the drywall basement ceiling enough to support constantly expanding rings of Altenaria colonies. So I wiped them up now and then, but they always came back. So mold growth is normal in houses and most of the fungi that I'll talk about today are nowhere near as frightening as Thacobotrys. I want to talk about the fungi in typical buildings where some modest mold growth and diversity can be expected. So where do fungi hide in a house? And what are these different ecosystems that I mentioned? So let's come into this secret house the way that most fungi do, which is through the front door. And the first thing you see is an arid plain with no water and little organic matter, much like a desert. And I'll spend the last part of the talk describing this kind of arid environment. But turn the corner and there are carpets. A Japanese colleague of mine once called carpets a treasure trove for the mycologist. They capture dirt and mud from people's feet and pets' feet. It's still dry, but this savanna looks like a good place for a fungus to hide and start growing. But many of the fungi that blow through the window, the spores that blow through the windows, form a thin layer of dust, like what's on top of this door frame. And it's hard to be sure which fungi actually live there and which ones are just tourists. But Let's spend a moment here in the third environment, the toilet and shower room with its heat, humidity, rivers and rain. It's very much like a tropical rainforest and many water loving fungi live here. The caulking around the edges of sinks and toilets and bathtubs and windows and the scum on toothbrushes and soap often turns pink or black with fungal growth. We usually blame this on Oreobacidium polyolans, which some people call mildew, but which mycologists call a black yeast. And it's not what anyone would call a photogenic fungus. Slimy fungi like Oreobacidium tend to stick to surfaces and their spores don't find their way into the air easily because their slime holds them in place. And even in a typical bathroom tropical rainforest, there are dry times and the slime dries into a film that protects the spores when the environment dries out. The slime contains a water absorbing pectin like molecule called polyolan, and it makes oodles of this gelatinous slime when it's grown in a fermenter. The polyolan is used in hairspray and skin creams or is polymerized into tr translucent films used to make those minty dissolving brush strips. I was going to try to get Catherine to share some breath myths with you today, but it's not a live meeting, you know, so it just wasn't possible. In the wild, Oreobacidium grows on stone and wood and leaves. <clears throat> and oddly enough in glacial waters. And uh, the species has a genetically homogeneous population structure all over the world with no pattern based on geography or substrate, just like people do. And this suggests that Oribacidium is constantly mixing up its genes. So it must be having sex frequently, but we don't have a clear idea of what its sexual state is. And it also means that it's moving around the globe freely and one theory is that it spreads from home to hotel, hotel room to home. Maturists unknowingly carry the spores of this bathroom fungus around on their toothbrushes and hand soap. So Oribacidium seems to be urbanized. Fungal diseases of skin are often associated with public showers or bathing facilities. And about 70% of people worldwide have fungal infections in their lifetime, and I am one of them. That's my foot. Most athletes' foot, jock itch, and ringworm is caused by one fungus, Trichophyton rubrum, which apparently originated in Africa and uh, hitched a ride to con other continents in the 19th century when people started wearing clothed shoes. So I have an invasive species on my feet. 
So here we are back in the desert again with some furniture and some carpets. <clears throat> Just think of the dust mites there. And this strange creature who is undoubtedly harboring some dog-specific skin fungi between his toes and shedding vast quantities of doggy dandruff yeast, which is different from people dandruff yeast. Don't worry, he's not always in this pen. I just put him in there to stop him from attacking my shoes when I made the video. And over here in the window, the window is an agricultural ecosystem, house plants, where one can affect another source of fungi in the built pathogen, environment. This symbionts. one in particular, this is a succulent thyme, it's coleus, and it drops its leaves onto the soil and they get quite oh, fuzzy. Oh, I see, there's, another, there's another soundtrack going here. Okay, that'll stop. <laughs> this particular herb is a coleus called broadleaf thyme. And when the leaves dry up and fall onto the soil, they're often covered with a grayish fuzz of Botrytis cinerea. Botrytis grows on dead succulent plant material and just about every kind of berry that you find will, will develop a Botrytis colony if you leave them out long enough on the counter for a few days. And under the microscope, Botrytis is rather beautiful if you, catch the spores before they fall off. It looks like a bunch of grapes. And that's what the name Botrytis means, is a bunch of grapes. And there are, of course, many fungal diseases that attack house plants, just as they attract crop plants. Uh, one of the uh, famous things that Botrytis is involved with is something called noble rot. And that this is a case where in the vineyards, the Grape berries are developing these colonies of botrytis, and some strains give the wine a very special flavor, and enough to make the wine worth three or four times as much as it would normally be. And it's it's somewhat similar to ice wine. I don't know if there's ice wine in uh, if you're familiar with that in in the United States. I think they do make it. It sucks the water out of the grapes, and it makes the um, sugars very concentrated. I find the wine, this kind of wine tastes a little bit moldy. It's really not my favorite, but. So, and, and here's one of the other uh, diseases that you might find in houseplants is often a, a fusarium kind of wilt of, of houseplants that, that get too much water on them. There's not so many mushrooms in a house. This one is called the flower pot parasol. Parasol, and, and it's one of the few mushrooms you'll see growing. It goes in, in uh, potted plants. And I've only seen it once, um, not in this house, but in a previous house I lived in. But there's a fair number of records of it for Illinois and iNaturalists. So I think it may, may be very, fairly common in, uh, in your area. So in the kitchen, we find foodborne fungi, especially on this rich decaying matter in the compost bucket. So if you don't empty it, every day it quickly fills up with molds and one of them is rhizopus stolonifer that grows so rapidly over bread products that its colonies often spill over the edge of the compost bucket like a fog of wet cotton sprinkled with pepper and when you look through the microscope you see stolons jumping around just like the runners of a strawberry plant and there's a related species, Rhizopus arise, that's used to make tempeh. So if any of you are vegetarians or vegetarian friendly, you may have tried uh, tempeh in your diet. And one of my seminal experience in Bryce Kendrick's lab when I was an undergraduate student was making tempeh in the lab and then eating it, cooking it over a Bunsen burner. So I just wanted to mention Aspergillus fumigatus. It's a heat tolerant mold. And it often grows in self-heating substrates like compost, but usually not in household compost. It's more in the industrial scale compost where there's a lot of self-heating that grows on. And it causes a wide range of health problems from allergies to various invasive growths called aspergillomas. And the fungus is a major cause of hospital acquired infections and kills thousands of people every year seems to be associated with renovations in hospitals. And the inset shows the hospital across the road from where I used to work, which had a problem with fumigatus when they built a new wing and it invaded the elevator shaft for some reason. Now, a small percentage of people also with uh, serious flu or COVID infections develop aspergillus infections. So that might encourage you to keep up with your vaccines. But 
even without compost, moldy food is a major issue in the kitchen. And there are two penicillium species pathogenic on oranges, and they certainly make a mess. And this often happens when citrus fruits, fruits especially clementine oranges, uh, are forgotten at the bottom of the crisper or roll underneath the counter. And the spreading green colonies are the developing spores here. And there'll be about 10 billion spores on these two oranges by the end of a week. So one spore for every person on earth with some left to spare. But some of the fungi in a fridge are, they're supposed to be there. And like this penicillium species, that's an active agent in all kinds of blue cheese. So this penicillium roccafortii, and it's the main fermentive agent in Stilton, Gorgonzola, and Roccafora. That's a two-faced fungus though. It grows well at low temperatures. So it grows well in a refrigerator. It doesn't need much oxygen and it tends to tolerate the acids and chemicals that we use to preserve food. So then it becomes a spoilage agent. Um, so <laughs> it, it, if you like blue cheese, like I do, and you keep it in your drawer, you'll, your refrigerator will be colonized by that fungus and, and it may spoil other food. In nature, it often grows in the silage that's fed the cattle. And there it makes some rather nasty toxins, but it doesn't make those toxins when it grows on milk. So we call the toxins that fungi make mycotoxins. And I think most of you will know about the toxins of uh, Amanita species and other mushrooms, but many molds do make mycotoxins. And this is the main reason that you should not eat moldy food, at least don't eat moldy food that's intended to be moldy, like, like this cheese. So let's leave the kitchen environment now for a moment and head to the basement to talk about wood decay. So buildings do have a lot of wood in them. And if it gets wet, it starts to rot. And in my first job, I was assigned to examine the wood pilings supporting the precursor of this building, which was a library at Concordia University, and the building was starting to sink. So in downtown Montreal, as it is in parts of Chicago, the buildings are built on wooden, wooden pilings, poles that are about 50 feet or long, 50 feet long or longer. And they're jackhammered into, the, into wet land to stabilize the ground. So the poles become saturated with water, which means that normally there won't be enough oxygen there for the wood to decay. But if these poles start to dry out, if they start, if the ground starts to dry out, then you can start to have problems. So we were contracted to descend into the sub-basement of this building where the engineers had kindly excavated three pilings for us to examine. And our job was to determine whether they were structurally sound and therefore whether the building was safe. And this is not the mycology you learn in school. We, we poked and we scraped and we isolated some cultures. And then we decided that the outer centimeter, half inch or so of these pilings was soft, but the inner foot, foot and a half of the wood beneath was solid. So we, were, we gave the building owners what we thought were comforting conclusions, but within a few years, they tore down the old building and, and replaced it with this one. They were probably looking for an excuse to do that in the first place. The most fungal, the most famous uh, wood decay is called dry rot and is caused, caused by this corticioid basidiomycete circular lacrimans. And in nature, this species is usually only found high in the mountains of Asia, uh, but in in Europe and North America, it apparently hitchhiked to the New World hundreds of years ago on the same wooden ships that ferried humans. So the, the human invasive species brought along another invasive species with them. This fungus just needs enough water for its spores to germinate, which is why it's called dry rot. Then it makes more water by breaking down cellulose. So the water flows back to the dark parts of the colony through the rhizomorph-like mycelial cords and these expanding mycelial fans. And rusty brown crusts ripple along the floorboards, usually underneath on the saline joists about six or seven centimeters per day, usually hidden from view. And eventually if it sporulates clouds of spores, blow through the heating dust and you get this 
this dust, this rusty powder settling onto the floor, which is the only clue you'll get before the floor or sometimes the whole building collapses. Still, the basement is the part of the house where you're most likely to see macrofungi. So clusters of this so-called, uh, it's not the flower pot pyrosol, it's the domicile cup fungus that tend to pop out on wet cardboard, plaster, sand, gravel and coal dust in cellars, caves and greenhouses. And I've never seen it. Perhaps some of you have. There's only a few uh, observations from Illinois on iNaturalist. And this one is from the south part of Chicago. But it's not just uh, fungal spores that give a distinctive odor to the wet basement. So um, among what hygienists call microbial volatile organic compounds or MVOCs are several small molecules that are made by molds and mold-like uh, bacteria called actinomycetes, which drift easily into the air. And our noses are very sensitive to these, these uh, molecules. And it, they include this 2-octane-1-all, which is a very melodious name, I'm sure you'd agree, which is said to have a green fatty smell. And geosmin, which is the, the earthy, musty smell that you get off of um, that's, that's what you really think of as a, mo a moldy smell. So people exposed to these molecules sometimes do get headaches and fatigue and eye irritation, nose and throat irritation. Um, but the health significance of this exposure is unclear. But just to point out that sometimes if you do have a asthma-like or sneezing symptoms in a house, it may not be spores, it, it can be these molecules. So I've shown you a few distinct environments inside a house, but a meaningful survey has to consider all of these different ecologies, but actual surveys often rely on settled house dust. So settled house dust contains all the transients that blow in through the windows or come in through the front door and don't grow, but they grow quickly in culture. They're kind of weeds, so they grow in culture and they're they all they make a lot of spores so they they tend to be easily detected by dna based methods but there is also a real dusk ecology there really are fungi that grow in that environment and one of the most famous house dust molds is fleming's penicillin culture which was isolated as a contaminant in his very dusty lab the title of this book refers to the practice during the drug development, which occurred in, at Oxford in Howard Flowery's lab, that the workers had of coat, brushing their coats with the spores of the, their lab culture that made penicillin in case the lab would get destroyed by the German bombing of, of London during the Blitz. Penicillin, of course, launched the antibiotic revolution, and this extended human lifespans for about 15 years. A lot of people wouldn't meet their grandchildren if it wasn't for penicillin. But back to my basement. So what is house dust? Here is our vacuum cleaner canister, which collects all the dust in this house. And this is actually the type's locality for a few new species, one of which I'll talk about in a moment. And you can see this has many kinds of material. And you can see just how fine that dust is. And I almost feel like sneezing just from looking at this. And here's what the house dust looks like through the microscope. So there's all kinds of organic and inorganic particles and fragments here, bits of insects. And you shouldn't forget about this compound called beta-glucan. It's a component of fungal cell walls and that causes serious allergic reactions and asthma in susceptible people. So again, it's not just living fungal spores that are important if you want a healthy house. If you've had mold contamination in the past and it didn't get cleaned up, the beta-glucan can still be there. And I would be remiss if I did not at least mention dust mites here. These are pinpoint sized arachnids that have invaded most temperate homes. They are another invasive species that's invaded the human built environment. And perhaps uh, originally introduced as hitchhikers on mice, house mice. They have a loose symbiosis with molds. They eat their hyphae and distribute their spores uh, 
when the food comes out the other end. But this is a mycology talk and it would be inappropriate to tell you how much of this spore laden poop ends up in your bedding and pillows. So quite often fungi, fungal surveys use agar media and here house dust was sprinkled onto two media at the same time. So the start of the growth on the medium called DG18 on the right is delayed. And this medium favors organisms that don't need much water. And we call this group xerophiles. So after five days, the growth on DG18 is clearly different than that on MEA on the left, which favors water loving fungi. Many of the household fungi in that desert part of the house are xerophiles and we don't really see them unless we use special techniques like using DG18. They don't need much water to grow. And in fact, they may not grow at all if there's too much water. So if you hire a consultant to survey molds in your house, they may walk in with something like this RCS sampler. And there, as my colleague, George White shows. So by moving this vacuum around at shoulder height, it captures the particles that people are actually breathing. And the sampler kind of looks like a lightsaber from a Star Wars movie, but it draws a specific volume of air through the top and it passes it over a collecting device that can be used to calculate the spore concentration. So the two strips on the left are from an RCS sampler. And again, you can see that those two media are finding different fungi. And again, you can see that the different environments, in this case, uh, a radiator and a window frame um, are, are yielding different fungi. And if you want to culture or calculate concentrations of fungal spores, this is one way to do it because the volume of air sucked up by that machine is measured. And then you can count the colonies on the strip and then you, there's a formula and you can plug it in. Or you can uh, capture the spores on some sticky tape on a slide and that can be used for microscopy. So here you can see there's a lot of round spores, probably a penicillium or aspergillus and a lot of other kinds of particulate debris. And you'll see a moment there goes a Canadian four of aspergillus going by. So this doesn't require culturing, it's a direct visual method. And you can use tape yourself in your house. So what you, you use the clear stuff, just transparent like glass. It's not the translucent stuff that they call invisible tape that you use to wrap presents with. So you press the sticky side against something that looks moldy to you, and then you can make a microscope slide out of this. So if you have a microscope, I invite you to explore your world with tape. So did you ever wonder about that black stuff on those plastic lawn chairs? Fungal spores, pollen also. How about the stains? in the tank of that dehumidifier in your basement. So we've seen this one before, it's spores of Altenaria again. And how about the black scum around the edge of the dog's bowl? It's Cladosporium again. So please don't call the Humane Society, I did clean this up, honest. In 2009, my lab, collaborated in an international survey of fungi and house dust using both agar and DNA based methods. So that was the time when the next generation um, DNA sequencing methods came out four or five or sequencing, which was eventually replaced by Illumina. So we found the DNA of about 7,000 fungal species worldwide and the indoor fungal profile varied a lot geographically, which is not all that surprising. But the surprise with it was that it tended to be more diverse in the tropical countries, sorry, more diverse in temperate countries than it was in the tropics. And, and we think that this is because temperate buildings tend to be closed up more for heating, uh, waiting for the snow. And uh, this tends to close in and, and kind of amplify the larger fungal populations. Whereas in tropics, those of you who've been to the tropics know that the buildings are often completely open. There are, 
the windows are never closed, there may not even be windows. So it doesn't tend to isolate the fungi as much. So late, later DNA surveys with more sensitive methods suggested a higher diversity than we saw indoors with about 2000, let's call them DNA species per household being a general average. So one of the samples came from the dust in my vacuum canister that I showed you. And in my house, we found about 600 fungal species. And many of them were harder, hard to explain. You know, as a mycologist, you want to explain why, why, why is this DNA there? And some of them clearly, clearly blew in from outside, but there was a sequence of an Amanita species that had only been seen in Japan. Maybe it came off some sushi, I don't know. And I was puzzled by the conifer endophytes marked here with uh, green dots until I remembered what happens at Christmas and where those Christmas tree needles end up. So in our survey, we found lots of the standard indoor fungi, but we also deliberately surveyed xerophilic fungi, the dry loving fungi. And we found many new species, but also um, some old friends. And the best known xerophilic fungi indoors is called Wolemia sebi. It's an ancient relative of mushrooms, so one of the few basidiomycetes that really grows like a mold. And it really seems to like living with people. It's like it's the pet dog of the mold world. It's brown and fluffy and just seems domesticated in some way, or else it's another inv invasive one. Now, our, but our, our Cohabitation seems to be a relatively recent occurrence. The myco its mycotoxins are probably not serious hazards, but 36% but of people in North America have IgE antibodies to this fungus. And the guilty protein is a cellulase enzyme. But we only see those antibodies going back about 50 years or so in the archived blood samples. So this is a relatively recent um, cohabitant with us. In nature, bulimia grows in high sugar environments and high salt environments like salt flats. And this one's in Puerto Rico. Indoor, indoors, bulimia contaminates food preserved with uh, sugar and sometimes contaminates maple syrup. And I've seen it even growing on wet pickling salt. And it also seems to be an active component of host dust. Among the xerophilic yeast-like fungi from my vacuum cleaner canister was this new yeast-like species. And what's interesting is that the DNA of this fungus has been detected before. Its DNA was the most frequent species detected on swabs from the back of this famous 480 year old self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. So this chalk and paper artwork has been lovely, lovingly kept in dry storage, but it's degrading from the activity of xerophilic fungi. And it makes me wonder if at some point in the distant past, Leonardo da Vinci may have touched the trees that ended up being dust in my house. He lived at the same time as Columbus. It's only logical, right? So to wrap up in some way, this wonderful Donald Duck exhibit was in the back of a cinema perched on a cliff on the coast of the big island of Hawaii. And the cinema was not well constructed and was exposed to the prevailing winds and frequent rain. And as you may know, in the tropics, the ceiling up of buildings is a lot more casual. So you could see the sky through the cracks between the wall and the buildings, wall and the ceiling. And when you turned around, the auditorium looked like this. You, you can see the mold on the ceiling tiles and on the back of the chairs. Those fans at the front of the exhibit seem to have been specifically placed to blow the spores in, into the faces of the audience. But this place obviously needs some remediation. What about where you live? If you're concerned about Walton Your House, here are two excellent references that are available free on the internet. And I'm gonna see if I can paste these URLs into the chat. There they are, good. Go backwards, okay. The um, 
The Canadian Construction Guide is particularly useful, probably even in the US, because um, it'll help you understand the different levels of contamination. So how much contamination you see and what personal protection equipment you might need um, for each level of inf infection and uh, infection colonization. So with, the, with that in hand, you may be able to tell whether you need to call in the professionals or if you're renting to call your landlord or the local medical officer of health. Keep in mind that, that um, molds can make toxins and that a heavy spore load is not healthy. So it probably indicates a, a moisture problem that needs to be fixed. May not mean the building needs to be evacuated, but it needs to be looked at. Keep in mind also that mankind did involve evolve on a moldy planet. So unless you suffer from serious allergies or asthma, basic hygiene can go a long way. So be informed instead of automatically being afraid. If you'd like to learn more about the biology of fungi in the built environment, as well as other ecosystems involving humans, you might start with my book. But for the non-mycological aspects of indoor ecology, such as dust mites, bed bugs, house mice, track down these other two books. The, the Badanus book, you'll recognize the title of Secret House, is a particularly funny book. So if you can track it down, you'll, you'll enjoy it. It's a great read. All of these books show that the built environment is much more complex than we tend to think. Now we spend much of our lives indoors, especially these last two and a half years. And our homes and our workplaces have a dramatic impact on our health. The ecology of the indoor environment deserves a lot more attention than it gets. So give it some thought. Of course, most of the work I discussed was done by other people and I was, really blessed in the last decade of my career to have this group of wonderful scientists in my lab, all of whom spent at least a little bit of time working on this project. So I'm very grateful to them, my former employer, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Carleton University, and the Alfred F. Sloan Foundation for grants for our research and then for writing of this book, and my publisher, Greystone Books. And I thank you for your interest. That was more interesting than I even thought it would be. <laughs> and I hope that's not taken as a, um, but I know uh, I've asked Greg and Matt to unmute in case they wanted to add something to this, because I know if you've got questions, you can put it in the chat um, and we'll unmute as needed. This was a great talk. Lorinda is absolutely right. Thanks a lot. Oh, Matt, you can unmute if you'd like to add something. Just wanted to say, yeah, you really enjoyed all the wild fungi you touched on, like those Wallemio mice seats always kind of blow my mind. And I uh, especially thought it was cool, uh, the, the work you and Anthony Amen and colleagues did looking at the diversity indoors and seeing kind of that reverse latitudinal gradient that you see where we actually have greater diversity in temperate areas, and there might be some interesting explanations for that. Um, I, I should look at... I should look in that data set and see if there's any lichen sequences I could send you. I, when I get bored, I sometimes go back in there and try to identify individual sequences. So there must be some in there. We've got lots of lichens out on the trees. Greg, did you want to add something? Well, it's just a great talk. I was wondering, Keith, is there any um, phylogenetic signal across there? So are the fungi, so there's higher diversity of fungi in the temperate zone. Is there a different, totally different community or is there overlap and the topics is just a subset or what? what's the deal with that? Yeah, you'd have to ask Anthony Amen that question because he really was the one that did that analysis. I, I, I think um, anecdotally, I would, I would say there's, it's, it's probably, you find Walimia everywhere. There's probably a set of 
20, that set of 20 or 30 really common aspergillus slash erosion species, I'm sure they're everywhere. But, and then you, as is typical with most DNA surveys, you get a very long tail of singletons or, or law, one or two tons, <laughs> you know, that, uh, and, and I think where, where the variation would be in the middle between the really common ones and the really rare ones that, that you would see more of a, I'm speculating, you'd see more of a regional signal. They, they've done some work in the United States too, and the guy's name escapes me at the moment. It's, it's quite a, a well-known paper. And, and they said that they could identify they could identify the geographical location that a sample came from without, like they could identify a blind. So, so that certainly indicates that there's a, there's enough uniqueness either in the specific species or in the, the relative abundance that they can tell. And it would surprise me, for example, in the Corn Belt, you know, there's going to be some really specific species like Fusarium uh, verticillioides on corn, you know, that gets into the air, shows up in indoor air surveys, so. Yeah, cool. So what was the piece of data that you had that shocked me the most was the speed. Could you repeat how fast uh, the circular lacrimans can go? Did you say six centimeters? It said by, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pulling something out of the literature there, but they said five to six centimeters per day but that that would be under like in enclosed cir circumstances underneath you know those I'm not sure I've ever seen it I may have seen it when I was in British Columbia because because they did have problems there in the buildings but but it those fans those rhizomorph like structures I think is what grows what zips along well, we do have some questions, if you don't mind, if there's not more comments, we can add later. Uh, but Donna inquired, how can you tell if you have been successful in killing fungi on drywall? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, so you can buy compound uh, products in the hardware store that say that they kill molds. And, and many of them are proprietary, so I don't really know what the active ingredient is. Um, people do tend to use bleach, which is not a good idea because bleach dries and it makes crystals and the crystals tend to be as noxious as the fungal spores. So that's generally not a good idea. And in my house, I tried to use 70% ethanol, 70% alcohol. So, and that was because I could get it out of the lab and it's 70% ethanol is known to be, um, known to be, the most effective concentration for entering into cells. And I have to, as I mentioned, I think that didn't really work. It got rid of it for a while, but it also came back because, because the leak was still there or the condensation was still there. So normally what, so if you find stachybotrys in a building, for example, you cut it out. So, so you don't try to clean it up. You, you cut out that drywall and you put in a new piece and you, you know, repaint. So that that's, if you really want to be sure it's it's gone, you get rid of where it's growing. But the, the first step is really to get, get rid of the moisture, find the leak or the situation, the lack of ventilation that's allowing condensation to build up <clears throat> and do that. Um, you, you could, if you had access to a lab, um, do swabbing and, and see after you think you've cleaned it up, you could swab say a week or two later and see whether you get any any growth off that swab. But uh, pr probably not even most of the contractors would be able to do that because they mostly don't uh, do culturing. So they're mostly doing direct observation. Um, somebody, uh, Julian asked, what was the magnification? I think just a, a general orientation on those images that we saw, what was the magnification? Well, they I would- I know it varied. <laughs> yeah, they would either be, uh, 400x, so high dry, we call it, or 1000x, which is the oil immersion lens on a microscope. Some, some of the images did have a scale, but some of them didn't. That's true. Uh, Danielle inquired, have you found in your research that any of these molds or whatever are beneficial to humans or buildings in some way? I don't think there's any evidence that that's the case. 
Um, we, we think of some of them as being banal. So, so for people who have a, a normal immune system who are immunosensitive, <clears throat> a, a bit of mold growth can be tolerated and, and, and probably isn't uh, going to do any damage. But as far as actually doing any, any good, you can find speculation about that on the internet, but I'm not aware of any data that supports that. Uh, how does, uh, Lindsay inquired, how does the development of sourdough bread fall into this subject? <laughs> that, that's a really good question. And there, there's a, a few paragraphs about, about sourdough bread in my, in my uh, book, but um, it does because, uh, as you know, from uh, sourdough bread, people tend to to keep the starter culture, and I think it gets colonized by skin fungi probably a lot. Um, we do have a lot of yeasts on our skin, so so it prob that's probably part of the the specialness of sourdough. But undoubtedly, there's also there are also a lot of airborne yeasts, and and they come off of they grow in, in on in flowers, they grow in nectar, they grow on the surfaces of leaves, and they undoubtedly get in along along with uh, bacteria that are also important in sourdough. Uh, how great is the variation within one climate or city? I think she's just trying to I don't know what that microclimates <clears throat> and such. Yeah. I think that, so as I mentioned to one of Greg's questions, there, there, you can look at the overall pro, DNA profile of the species in a building and tell what city that building was in. But that's not the whole profile. That's just part of it, whatever the signal part of the, of the information is that suggests that that comes from that city. Individual buildings will have unique profiles, just like individual humans have unique micro microbiomes. So there's going to be, if not absolutely unique species, there's going to be a, a relatively unique collection of species in, in each building, depending on, let's just imagine that you really like tempeh and you really like oriental foods like miso that has aspergillus in it, or you don't. So if you don't like those foods, you're not gonna have those fungi in your house. If you do like those foods, blue cheese, you're gonna have those fungi in your house. If you have a dog, a dog like I do, you might expect that you're gonna find a dog spe specific uh, skin fungi in your house. If you don't have a dog, well, maybe not, but if, but if you have a cattle or a cat or a duck, you might, you might find different fungi associated with them. So, so the, the the lifestyle that uh, people have in their houses is going to affect the the microbiota of their houses. Um, so are listerine strips made with some kind of mildew, mildew, sorry, <laughs> or a mildew derivative? I didn't quite understand the link. Yeah, so it, this fungus, when you grow it in culture, gets covered with a layer of slime. It looks like I, to be crude, it looks like somebody blew their nose on the petri dish, and and so that slime is this polyland stuff, and um, it's not inside this fungus; it's outside the fungus. It it sends it out into the environment, and there are other fungi that do that. So it, it it's it's separated from the fungus. It's collected, it's purified, and it's used to make those products that I mentioned, like hairspray, it's used in a lot of products. Are there any surprising hygiene cleaning tips for the household that we should know, like watching out for humidifier lung? Yeah, that's a complex question. Um, so humidifiers are a problem because they, they create they create within themselves a, a, a humid environment that fungi might like to grow in and then they blow it out. Um, so quite often when they put a humidifier into a public building, they have a good filtering system to, to filter out spores that might form in that situation. 
Um, and in general, I, I think the, in the last 20 years or so, the humidifier manufacturers have been more aware of this problem and, and they deal with it in various ways. Um, they, the most surprising one I did hint at in the, in the talk and that's pillows and bedding. And uh, so if you have children with allergies or, or if you yourself have allergies or asthma, this is really something to pay attention to. And what the hygienists say is to replace your pillow once a year and to use, you can buy bedding that um, it's, it's not like a rubber sheet, but, it, but it's, it's impregnated with enough rubber so that spores or other particles that are down in the mattress can't puff up when you lie down on the bed. They, they stay inside the mattress. So, and I expect <clears throat> that a lot of people who have very serious mold allergies would, would use an air mattress instead of a, a spring or a, or a cotton based mattress. But that's really for extreme um, people who have extreme illnesses or extreme sensitivities. But I think for the average person, replacing pillows every you know three years is a good move, and and uh, keep keeping a, an eye on your your bed, and especially the dust underneath the bed. I think one of the pic first picture I showed of the dust bunnies was underneath our bed. So, <laughs> <laughs> has any lichen been identified made by only two three species of fungi? Uh, parentheses, not, uh, open parentheses, not including other bacteria or algae species, close parentheses. I I should just turn that one over to Matt. I don't, so he's the like. Oh, oh, hey, Matt, why don't you answer that anyway? So the, I, I see you wrote it up, which is great, but um, I think we would enjoy to hear your opinion. So I've asked you to unmute. Sure. Um... Yeah, the kind of traditional idea is that the, the lichen itself is constructed of a, a single fungal species and a single algal species, but we're finding over time we've started to realize there's a lot more going on inside of a, a thallus. We need to think of it as being basically a, you know, a miniature ecosystem where there's all sorts of bacteria in there. Um, they're finding there can be multiple species of algae in there, and they're also finding there can be multiple fungi hiding inside there. And in many cases, it's unclear what exactly those fungi are doing. And that's a very active area of, of research. Um, are they just kind of passive and sort of hanging out there? Or are they actually contributing um, to kind of the synthesis of that phallus? Or are they an integral um, member to that that symbiosis and so that's kind of a, a real hot area of research right now there, that said there's also some fungi that um we see growing on lichen thalli that are not not the ones actually making the thallus but they seem to be either mycoparasites so fungi that are parasitizing and eating other fungi or they might be tapping into the algae and getting sugars from them uh, but not contributing to the formation of a thallus. So they're not actually protecting the algae in any way. Um, so there, there is other stuff, but it's a bit unclear how, what the importance of their, um, their role to uh, the formation of these thalli. Wow. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> so I think we're finished. Unless somebody else has something more to say or any other questions. Nope, I think we're good. So we'll see you next month. Those that come live will be at the Niles Museum. And those that wish to join us via the internet will be welcome as well. Any other party words? I think that's it. Thank you, sir. Keith, this was great. I'm glad that it worked. <laughs> yes, but you also made it quite understandable terrific so well, thank you so thank you thank you thanks everybody for the invitation. yes right. and um and i will make sure that some of the notes and the references that he had um will get saved and we'll uh, give them to stephanie to put into the newsletter because there was a lot of interesting additional information okie doke
Yes, uh, the, obviously the Niles Museum will be in the next announcement. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.